By the end of this video, we're going to get our objects randomly instantiating on top of these platforms, like our enemies and our gems. We're going to do this by passing in our tile map and checking which locations are available for our spawn points. Then when we change level, we'll remap these spawn points and continue our game. The script is quite long and complicated, so if you do feel like being lazy but also supporting the channel, you can check it out on my Patreon, as well as all other scripts on this channel. So right now in our scene, we have these placed gems and enemy. We're not going to need these anymore, I'm just going to untick them for now so they disappear from our scene and instead we're going to randomly instantiate these. My levels are made up of grounds and walls so with this script what we're going to do is pass in this ground tile so then only these tiles will have gems or enemies appear on top of them so we don't get gems and enemies appearing in random places. So first I'm going to make a new game object and call this object spawner. I'm going to add to this a new script and call it object spawner and open this up. First I'm going to set up all the variables we need. So first we'll do a public enum called object type and we're going to have a small gem, a big gem or an enemy. You can keep adding to this list if you want more items in the spawner. Next we'll need our public tile map, which I'll call tile map. We'll need using Unity engine tile maps. Then we'll want an array, so a public game object array of our object prefabs. Then we're going to want a float for the chance of spawning a big gem, which I'll call big gem probability, and I'm going to set this to 0 0.2. So we'll have a 20% chance of spawning a big gem. Then we'll do another one for our enemy probability, which we'll do to 10%, so 0.1f. Then for the spawner I'm going to want a max amount of objects and then when it hits that point it'll stop spawning. Oops, so that's a public int max objects and I'll set that to five. And then I'll do a public float gem lifetime which I'll set to 10 which means after 10 seconds our gems are going to fade away and we won't have this affect our enemy. And we'll do one more float for our spawn interval and I'll set this to 0.5f. So every half a second we'll pop something in. Now we want some private variables. So I want a private list of vector free and this is going to be our valid spawn positions. And we'll set this to a new list of vector free. Then we want a private list of game objects and this is going to be for our spawned objects so we can go back to them. New list of game objects and then we want a private ball called is spawning. We'll set that to a default false. Cool so that's our variables. So first of all in our start what we're going to do is have a function to gather our valid positions. So where can we spawn our items which we want to be on top of our tile map. So let's write a function for this. So we'll go private void gather valid positions. First off we're going to go valid spawn positions dot clear just in case we've moved level and our platforms have changed. We want a clean slate each time. Now we're going to grab our cells bounds from our tile map. So we're going to go bounds int, we'll call it bounds int equals tile map dot cell bounds. What this does as the tooltip says is returns the boundaries of the tile map in cell size. So basically we're getting the shape of our tile map. Next we're going to want a tile base as an array and I'm going to name this all tiles. And we set this to tile map dot get tiles block and we pass in our bounds int. Next we're going to want a vector free called start. So we go tile map dot cell to world and pass in a new vector free int. And then we're going to want our bounds int dot x min and then our bounds int dot y min and then zero for our y. I didn't put this in brackets. We need another bracket on the end. Cool, now we've got all our tiles. We want to loop around these. So we're going to go for int x equals zero. x is less than pounds int dot size dot x and colon x plus plus. And inside here, if you copy this for loop, paste it inside itself and we're going to replace the x with a y. So we go around both our x and y at the same time. And what we're going to do is get our tile base, call this tile, and equal all tiles. And we'll grab the right tile by doing x plus y times bounds int dot size dot x. This grabs us the right tile. And just before we do anything, we're going to go if tile is not null, we'll say vector free place equals start plus new vector free. We'll pass in our x plus 0.5f. Just so we're never right on the edge of a platform, it gives it a little breathing room. And then we'll pass in y plus 2f. So this means it'll be floating just a bit above our platform. And then we'll pass in zero for our z. And then we'll go valid spawn positions dot add this place. So we found a valid position to put something on. So basically we're looping around our x and our y. If we find a tile within this x and y, then we say this is a valid place. So now we can take this function and in our start we'll call gather valid position. So next what we want to do is spawn our objects. Since I want objects to appear over time at certain intervals, it's the perfect time for us to use a coroutine. So before our main spawning function, I'm going to write a private i enumerator and call this spawn object if needed. In here we'll go is spawning equals true and we're going to want to say while however many active objects we have is less than our max objects variable so five then we'll spawn an object. To find out how many active objects we have I'm going to write a new private int called 
selective object count. And in here, we're going to go spawned objects dot remove all. So item equals greater than item equals null. So this is basically saying remove any items that are null. Then we're going to return our spawn objects dot count. Now we can call this function in our while loop. So while active objects count is less than max objects, we're going to spawn our object. In between spawning our objects, we want to wait. So we'll go yield return new wait for seconds. And then we'll pass in our spawn interval. And then at the very end, we'll go is spawning equals false. Cool. So now we're going to want a spawn object function. But first of all, let's go to our start and just go start coroutine, pass in our spawn objects if needed. And that's our start all done. Okay. So now comes the beast. Okay. So we're going to go private void spawn object. We'll say if our valid spawn positions dot count equals zero. We can actually keep this in one line and just go return. Else we're going to make a new vector free called spawn position for our final spawn position. We'll set this to a default of vector free dot zero. Then we'll say bool valid position found equals false. What we're going to do is have a while loop while not valid position found and valid spawn positions dot count is greater than zero. Then we'll go int random index equals random dot range and we'll pass in zero to valid spawn positions dot count. We're going to get a random position from our valid spawn position. Next, we're going to set a vector free called potential position and set this to our valid spawn position of our random index. So the reason I'm calling it potential position is because I'm going to get a vector free of the left position, which is going to be our potential position plus a vector free dot left. And then I'm going to duplicate this code down, replace left with right and check our right. So we're looking left and right. And what we're going to do with these positions is use them to check beside us and make sure there's not another object spawned right next to us. This stops all our gems from clustering in one area. So above this function, we're going to I want a new one. That's a private ball called position has object. Then we're going to pass in our vector free position to check. And here we're going to return our spawned objects dot any. And in our any, we'll pass in check obj equals greater than check obj and vector free dot distance. And in this distance, we'll pass in our check obj dot transform dot position and then pass in the position to check. And outside of this bracket, go less than 1.0f. So that big long check, it's got a squiggly underline because we need to use system link. This works. You probably know what this means, but we're basically checking a padding of one unit to whichever direction we're passing in. So if we copy this function, we can say if not position has object and pass in our left position and not position has object, then pass in our right position. Then we know we've got a nice clear spot. We're going to go spawn position equals potential position, and then valid position found equals true. And that'll break us out of our while loop because we're happy with this position we're going to take it we're going to go valid spawn position dot remove that and then pass in our random index so no one else can use it so now if we have a valid position we're going to type object type call this object type and we're going to get a random object type from our enum to know which object to instantiate so let's scroll up and write another new function we'll go private object type We'll call this random object type. And in here, we're going to go float random choice equals random dot value, which gets us a value between one and zero. So we use one as 100%. And then we'll say if our random choice is less than or equal to our enemy probability, then we'll return object type dot enemy. Else if our random choice is less than or equal to, and I'll put this in brackets, our enemy probability plus our big gem probability, then you guessed it, we'll return our object type dot big gem. Else we'll simply return our small gem. Or we can copy this function and set our object type be our random object type. Now we'll say game object chosen prefab equals our object prefabs and then we'll pass in square brackets and then also normal brackets. Int outside those brackets we'll say object type. Cool so now we can go game object game object and equal this to instantiate and then inside here we want to grab our prefab using this type so we're going to go object prefabs, square brackets, and then the brackets, pass this to be an int, and then we'll say object type. So this gets us our object from our array of this type. Then we'll want our transform to be our spawn position. And then we just pass in quaternion identity, which is its rotation. Now that's spawned, we want to add it to our spawned objects list. So spawn objects dot add game object. Now we want our gems to be destroyed after a certain amount of time so that they keep moving around the place. So we're going to say if our object type is not equal object type dot enemy, then we're going to start a coroutine of a new function that we haven't written yet, but we're going to destroy our gems after a certain amount of time. So just below this, we'll go private I enumerator, call this destroy object after time. And we're going to pass in our game object, call it game object, and then a float for our time. And what we're going to do is yield return new wait for seconds pass in our time and then we'll say if we still have our game object 
because of course we may have picked up this game object by now and it be destroyed by us collecting it. We'll say spawned objects dot remove this game object and valid spawn positions. We're going to add back in our game object dot transform dot position and then we'll destroy our game object. Cool. So in our start coroutine just above, we'll pass in our destroy object after time, pass in our game object, and then we're going to pass in our gem lifetime. Cool. Let's take our spawn object function. We need to paste this up in our spawn objects if needed. Okay, so that's what happens when we start. So if we go back into Unity, we can set this up. You need to drag your ground tile map into the object spawner and then pass in your free object prefabs. So we've got our small gem, our big gem, and our enemy. Remember this order matters since it needs to match with your enums. So make sure you have them in the right order. You can drag them around with this little bar. If we press play, we can see our item slowly spawning in. We actually have an error on our enemy right now, which we'll fix in a second. But you can see our gems spawn in, but they don't come back. That's because we got it working for start, but we still need to do some work in our update. But first of all, let's fix our enemy so he actually chases us. So in our scripts, if we double click on our enemy, right now we pass in our player transform. Instead, since we're instantiating him, let's make this a private transform. And we'll set player to equal game object dot find with tag, and then we'll pass in player. Then we'll go dot get component and pass in transform. Now even instantiated enemies can pick up our player and pick up the transform so we can chase them around. You need to make sure your player is tagged as well. So back in Unity, if we select our player and in tag, you can see there's a player tag already for you. So there we go, our enemy now follows us. Oh, two of them. So yeah, you can see they're spawning in. Our enemies obviously aren't being destroyed because we didn't want that to happen, but our gems aren't coming back. So we need to edit our update function. So let's go back to our object spawner script. And in update, we want to say if we're not spawning, so if is not is spawning, <laughs> and our active object count, which is our function we wrote below, is less than our max objects. We'll go start coroutine, same as above, spawn objects if needed. Cool, and that's all we need for our update to work. So if we go back and press play, we can now see our objects appearing. If I pick one up, nothing happens. Now I was going to say, when we go back here, you'll see when I pick up an item, it'll spawn new ones, but it's not doing it. So we have a bug. Instead of quickly fixing it, I'm going to go through debugging with you. So what we're going to do is press play. I'm going to pick up an item. So now I've got two gone and three still active. If I go to my script now in Visual Studio and click this play button on attach to Unity. Now what I want to see is why we're not spawning. So if we go on our update, if you click right on the side here in this gray area, it'll stick a breakpoint in. We've hit our breakpoint because we're always going around this if statement. Now active object count, let's check that's returning the right thing. So if we go inside here, we can see we're going to remove any objects that are null. There should be two that are null, so there should be two that get removed. If we check, our count is still five, which is our max objects. So that's why we're not spawning any more objects. So something's happening where these aren't being removed. We can check inside, we can see there are two that are null. So I don't know if you've spotted the problem yet, <laughs> but I didn't put two equals. What I really needed to do was say, is our item equal to null? I just said, item equal null. And that's how bugs are formed. <laughs> Hopefully that was interesting for you to see, but yeah, if we go back to Unity now and press play again. Now when I pick up an item, you can see a new one is spawned and replaces it. So we always have five items or enemies. You can see I've picked up enough to move to the next level in our bar here. So let's see what happens when we move to our next level. We do this by holding down E. We can see our gems aren't positioned on the right place. They're appearing where our old platforms were on level one, not for level two. This is because when we change level, we don't do anything to get our new valid spawn locations. The way we're currently changing levels is by deactivating level one, and then we reactivate level two. If you change scene and add in this object spawner, it should just get your valid locations for you. But for us, we're gonna go into our script and in our update at the top, we're gonna say if not tarmap dot game object dot active in hierarchy and it's been deactivated so our level has been changed we're going to call our function called level change we can write this just below and go private void level change and then we're going to need to find our next tile map tile map we want is inside our levels and it's called ground they'll always be the same name this is important for this to work so make sure we also the same because what we're going to do is say tile map equals game object dot find we're going to pass in ground so we're looking for a game object called ground and then we're going to get the component and get the tile map. We're then going to call gather valid positions, our function from the beginning. And then what we need to do is destroy all our spawned objects so they don't come with us to the next level. So let's scroll down to where we destroy our objects. And we'll go private void and call this destroy or spawned objects. And we'll simply go for each game object called obj in our spawned objects. If our object is not null, we can destroy obj. 
and then our spawned objects dot clear. So we clear our list after destroying our objects. So we'll go back to the top and then under gather valid points we go destroy all spawned objects. Now our level change function is done we can put that back up in our update. And I just made another mistake but in this for each loop this spawned objects dot clear we don't want inside the for each we want it outside. Just make sure your prefabs positions are all set to zero otherwise they'll be instantiating at random floating places like this enemy and just more gem and i've actually changed you know where i said you could mess around with your x and y padding here i changed mine down to 1.5 from 2 uh, in gather valid positions so you can change this too after testing out what you see is best for yours but yeah our gems on the bottom float a little higher just because the sprite that we're using is smaller than the thick platforms above so this is something to keep in mind as well i think we got enough enemies here quick change level. We can see now when we change level our gems are positioned nicely on top of these platforms. Look at that one beautifully sitting on top. Oh that looks nice. Obviously you can edit this as much as you like to be the kind of thing you're looking for for your game. But yeah this is what I wanted for this platformer. In our next video we're gonna get our player hit. We're gonna hit our player. Uh, we're gonna make it so when our enemies touch our player we actually take damage. On the script for this one was quite complicated so if you want to support the channel and get the script without any of the effort from yourself you can find it on my patreon as well as all other scripts i've ever written this whole channel cool see ya